In this video, we're going to discuss the spectral properties of a matrix, and more specifically, we're going to discuss the Gersh-Gorin circle theorem. Let me remind you that when you have a matrix A, which is Q times Q with values in R in C, then it will have Q eigenvalues in C counted with their multiplicity. The spectrum of A which we denote by sigma of A, is the set of the eigenvalues of A, which is included in C. I also would like to remind you that if A is a Q by Q matrix, then there exists a upper triangular matrix T and a unitary matrix U, such that A can be written U times T, which is the triangular matrix, times the inverse of U, and since u is unitary, it means that u star, the transposed of u, will be u minus 1, the inverse of u. Now, finding the spectrum of A is something that can be complicated. Complicated in the sense that when the matrix is really large, it will take a long time to compute these uh, eigenvalues. Basically, one could say all I need to do is to put the matrix in triangular form, which is true, but this operation, this, the, 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 doing this, will have a complexity in Q cubed, which means that if you have a matrix which is 100 times larger than another one, then the time it will take to compute the eigenvalues will not be 100 times longer, it will be one million times longer. So you see, this is where the complexity in Q cube, cubes is really a problem if you have very large matrices. Now, it is true that we can actually bring down the complexity to Q power, raised to power 2.3, but even then, it's still pretty large uh, and, and pretty difficult to compute the eigenvalues in for very large matrices. So what we need to see is a theorem that will actually provide you with a way to locate, roughly, the eigenvalues. I'm not saying we're going to get the eigenvalues. Uh, what I'm going to do is to somehow be able to locate them. Let me explain. Uh, I'm going to consider a matrix A, and I'm going to denote A, I, J, the components of A. Now, the Gashgurin uh, theorem, I mean circle theorem, says this. I'm going to compute uh, for each line uh, a coefficient in number Ri, which will be the sum of the absolute value of all the components of that line. I will just skip uh, the, 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 the column where the column reaches the line, in other words, the diagonal term of the matrix, will not be included in that sum. But all the other terms of that line will basically we will take the absolute value and add this up, and that will be R i. And I will define the disk will be a closed disk of uh, basically centered in A i i, which is the term on the diagonal of the matrix of line i, and with the radius R i. Okay, so that disk is will be called D i, and that's the definition of the Gershgorin disk. Now the theorem is that the spectrum of A, in other words, any eigenvalue, no matter what it is, the eigenvalues will be in the union of these disks. They cannot be anywhere else. Let me uh, prove this theorem. Actually, the proof is very easy. So first you consider an eigenvalue, so an element of the spectrum of A. And if it's an eigenvalue, then obviously there is an eigenvector associated to it, actually a full, at least a full line, uh, maybe more, but I mean at least a full line uh, of, of, of vectors. So I'm going to consider a vector u uh, for which the associated, um, um, I mean, for an eigenvector u uh, such that the norm infinity of u is equal to 1. So I can, I, can, I can do that. What I will have, therefore, is that there exists an i uh, between 1 and q, an integer, such that the absolute value of ui is equal to 1, right? Since the norm infinity of u is equal to 1. And obviously, for all other uh, components of that vector u, uh, well, that will have a, the, the absolute value will be smaller than 1. 
OK. Uh, now, what I'm saying is that AU is equal to lambda U, since U is an eigenvector associated to the, the eigenvector, uh, since U is the eigenvector, is an eigenvector associated to the eigenvalue lambda. So if I look at what happens to the ith component of AU, well, that would be lambda times the ith component of U. Now, what it means is this, that the sum for j equals 1 to q of a uh, um, j i j u j will be equal to lambda u i. So let me rewrite this this way. I'm going to pull out the term that is a i i u i. And so I'm left with this. And of course, I'm going to move that to the other side. So that will be uh, the equality between that sum and lambda minus AII of UI. Let me actually write it in this direction, it's the same thing. And then I'm going to take the absolute value. So if I take the absolute value to the left hand side, I have the absolute value of UI. Well, that's going to be 1. So that's uh, lambda minus AII, since again, uh, absolute value of ui is equal to 1. And to the right hand side, I can say that this, the absolute value of this sum is going to be smaller than the sum of the absolute values. But as you see, uh, the absolute value of uj uh, is just written slightly above. It's going to be smaller than ui, which is equal to 1. So that will be smaller than the sum of the absolute values of aij, uh, which basically is ri. So, in the end, what I have is that lambda is indeed. So, you see, I've proven that the spectrum is included in the union of disks. Now, let me actually give an example so we really understand how things work here. Uh, let me consider this matrix, uh, 4 by 4. Well, obviously, if it's a 4 by 4 matrix, um, I don't really need this gersh uh, uh circle theorem. I mean, but but I'm just going to uh, to, to to apply to that to that very simple matrix. Uh, I'm saying I don't need it because I could just do the computation by computing the determinant of a minus lambda times i, or I could just put it in triangular form with no problem. Obviously, the the, the reason why we want, we like this theorem, this Gersh-Gorin theorem, is uh, to apply to large matrices. But I'm just going to show you on an example, so that's why uh, I'm just taking a small matrix. But I need to apologize for doing this. All right, so let's let, let's look at how it works. Okay, so uh, let me look at the first line. For the first line, I have a11, which is five, and uh, well, r1 that will be the other terms. That's two plus zero plus one, so that's three. Let's move on to the next line. So a22, the diagonal term is going to be three. And R2 will be, well, the absolute value of negative 1, that's 1 plus, well, obviously I skip 3, so I go to 2 uh, plus 1, that will be, that will be 4. Uh, then uh, the third line, well, A3 will be negative 2, and all other terms are going to be, to be 0. So that's uh, R3 is equal to 0. And finally, the last line, uh, I get 8 uh, for the diagonal term. And the radius R4 will be 1 plus 1. That's obviously 2. All right, so let's uh, actually put the disks on this, on this graph. So uh, here is for, for A11. So I'm putting a disk centered in 5. And uh, the radius is going to be 3. Uh, then I'm going to put another a disk centered in 3 with a radius 4. Then a disk, well, centered in negative 2 with radius 0, that's going to be a point. And finally, uh, at 8, a, a disk uh, centered in, in 8 and with radius 2. So here is where the eigenvalues will be. They will be in this, in the, in this red set. I, I don't know where they are. I'm just saying that they, they're here in, 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 in this red set. So, for instance, if someone says, um, well, is it possible to have a, 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 an eigenvalue which is 10 plus 10i? Well, the answer is no, it's not possible. It's not in the red set. So, you see, it does not give you the eigenvalues, but it gives you a location, uh, you know, which can be precise or not so precise, but, I mean, it tells you where they, where they can possibly be. Now, of course, because it's a 4 by 4 matrix, it's not very, e very difficult to compute the actual eigenvalues. So I did that for you. 
And here where they are, uh, here are the four eigenvalues of, uh, of our matrix. And obviously, as you can see, they are indeed in, uh, that, uh, uh, in, in that space. Okay, uh, so that is for the Gershgorin uh, circle theorem. Uh, you can see that there is already a possible application for the Gershgorin circle theorem, which relates to what we just said in a previous video. Uh, when you're looking for the preconditioner of a matrix, then, as we said, you want the eigenvalues of Pa to be as close as possible to 1. What I'm saying is that the Gershgorin circle theorem will uh, tell you an area where they can be located. Uh, so again, it won't give you the eigenvalues, but it might be helpful in saying where they can possibly be, therefore giving you some information about whether or not Pa is, uh, has the eigenvalues that you know, are close to 1 or not. So that will allow you to uh, get an estimate on how good your choice of P, the preconditioner, possibly is.